This is some really, really cool stuff. Thanks for popping in with us today. It's the end of the work week, and we've got a real treat for you. Um, I'm Ari Sarsalari. I'm a meteorologist. All those uh, wolves you're looking at there, uh, most of them, I believe, are Mexican wolves, and those are like an extremely endangered species, okay? Um, and what they've just done, actually, uh, down near St. Louis in Missouri is um, they have used artificial insemination to, um, you know, have a, have a pup. A pup, a wolf pup. Can you call it a puppy? I don't know. You know what? There's somebody here with us that knows a lot more about wolves than I do. And her name is uh, Regina Misati. She is uh, the Director of Animal Care and Conservation down at the uh, Endangered Wolf Center. This is in Eureka, Missouri, um, just outside of St. Louis. And a couple of things here. First of all, there has been a tremendous amount of flooding down in that area, okay? So we've got, this is kind of like a two-fold Facebook Live. I want to talk about just how you know, interesting and all the science um, behind, you know, these animals and the, the fact that they're endangered. I also want to talk about the flooding and how they've been dealing with it. Okay, Regina, let's bring her in. Um, tell me about Mexican wolves in general, because, you know, when you think about wolves, I always think about, like, just really massively huge dogs, basically. They're like dogs, but bigger. But these guys don't look that big, are they? They aren't. Mexican wolves sp specifically are actually only about 60 to 70 pounds on average. So they're a lot smaller than what you'd see on the movies. We like to make everything bigger and, and better in the movies, right? <laughs> uh, these guys are, yeah, only about 60 to 70 pounds, and they are one of the most endangered mammals in the entire world. There's only about 130 left in the wild, mostly found in the United States, in New Mexico and Arizona. Wow, okay, so um, how did you guys go about doing this? So, or Like, how long did you have the idea before it was implemented, and how did the process go? Yeah, well, we've been working on collecting genetic samples from Mexican wolf males for over 20 years wow. in collaboration with the St. Louis Zoo. So we've been working in, on this for a long time and hoping that research and technology would eventually ca catch up so that we could use this technique someday. So that's the puppy right there, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's a little guy. That's when he was just a few days old. Uh, Mom's doing such a great job taking care of him. How old is he now? He's about four weeks. Wow. Okay, so um, does, does he look healthy? Is everything going well? Yes, we do, uh, we're hands off with all of our recovery species and recovery just means that the Endangered Wolf Center works with endangered species to raise them in a way that they stay wild, that they can be released back into the wild and do really well. Um, but we do go in every once in a while and do health checks on our animals and puppies are no different. Um, so we go in and make sure they look okay, give them their vaccines. And our veterinarian said that he is one of the healthiest, strongest pups that she's ever seen. Wow, that's amazing. So do you guys uh, plan on doing this artificial insemination anymore here? Do you, is it something that could eventually possibly uh, help the species out, do you think? Yes, definitely. So to conserve a species, to help save endangered species, you need all the tools in your toolbox that you can have to help do that. And artificial insemination offers another tool where we can actually bring genetics that have been lost over the last 20 years back into this population and help make the species healthier and stronger. And more gene diversity means that the puppies are healthier, that they can uh, survive diseases better, and so on. And so we're really excited to be able to use this tool when it's needed. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely be trying this again. So why, why are Mexican wolves endangered? And actually, I'm sure you know more about wolves in general like how many of how many wolf species are endangered i mean you can give a ballpark and it doesn't need to be an exact number but you know when i th when you think about wolves what are most people thinking about are they thinking about timber wolves are they thinking about you know arctic wolves or what well i think most people think of the wolf they think of yellowstone they okay. think of the gray wolves that you see in yellowstone and you're definitely right most wolf species there's only a handful of them are all of them are endangered and the reason why is think about what you grew up with Little Red Riding Hood, Three Little Pigs, the movie Frozen and Beauty and the Beast that just came out all depict wolves as this big, bad, scary wolf. And if everybody could come work at the Endangered Wolf Center in St. Louis just for one day, they would see that wolves aren't like that. They're actually very shy. They want to stay away from people. And for example, the two most endangered wolves in the world, the Mexican wolf and the American red wolf, have never hurt a human in recorded history. But they just get a bad rap, unfortunately. Wolves definitely have a lot of misinformation out there and myths that surround them.
So what are the specific things that has actually led to them becoming endangered? Is it people shooting them? Is it, um, you know, basically people moving into their territory? I mean, what's the deal? Well, I think the two major things is you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's us. Um, we actually, in the early 1900s, led a campaign to eradicate all carnivores, uh, wolves, mountain lions, bears, because back then we thought that no carnivores meant hunter's paradise, more elk, more deer for us. Unfortunately, we didn't realize back then that the ecosystem is all in a perfect balance and everything is there for a reason and that without wolves and other carnivores, it falls apart. Um, and since that time, since we've learned how the web of life works, we've really tried to save these species and bring them back. Uh, the other big thing that's affecting wolves is habitat loss and pollution. Uh, so we can definitely do things in our own backyard to help wolves. If we can uh, bring back native plants, if we can reduce, reuse, and recycle, and use less, those are all things we can do to help save the wolf. So what other species of wolf do you guys have at this, um, at, at, at your facility? Is it, is it only Mexican wolves? No, we actually also work with the American red wolf, which is the most endangered mammal in the world. There's only about 30 of them left in the wild. Oh my. And the crazy thing about those guys is they are the American species. They are solely native to the United States, yet most people don't even know they exist, let alone that they're endangered. And we've been working on both the Mexican wolf and the red wolf program for over 30 years since the beginning of the efforts to save these two wolves. So how many in captivity do you have of the American red wolf then? There's about 200 animals in the captive program and then, like I said, about 30 in the wild. And the red wolf or the Mexican wolf is, is pretty similar. There's about 230 in captivity and then about 130 in the wild. Do you think there's any chance? I mean, th those numbers sound so low to me. I mean, um, what is the prognosis? I mean, do you, do you guys think you can bring back the species eventually? Absolutely, I do. Um, we've definitely seen a lot of headway with these species. We definitely, we hit roadblocks, bro but um, people out there being able to spread the information about wolves, it's true, um, how important they are to the ecosystem, that they're not the big bad scary wolf that you see in Disney movies or in the books or on the, on the big screen. Um, and just teaching people why they're so important. That's, that's going to help change people's minds and create acceptance. Okay, so I want to talk about all the flooding that you guys have been dealing with. Um, yeah. How, how has it been? I mean, I'm sure that, you know, it's been very hard to get around and things like that. I'm sure a lot of your employees have had trouble. I mean, what's the flooding situation been like uh, where you're at? Well, you can see some footage of it there. It's, it's been intense. Um, our keepers are so amazing. Um, we knew that this was coming. We had some warning and we put it out to our staff if anybody would be willing to stay on property just in case all the roadways got closed off. And our keeper staff stepped up and said, we'll do it. So they've been cut off from their families for quite a few days as the flooding increased. And luckily, they just got to go home uh, this morning and, and get to see their families again as the roadways are starting to open back up. So it's been an intense process and we've lost power and had to deal with some issues with that. But uh, luckily, the animals are high and dry and safe. And that's the most important thing. So the whole the whole place stayed uh, safe from the flooding. It was, it's really interesting to see in some of these spots. You know, you'll have one side of town that's a little bit lower than the other side of town. I think we saw this in, uh, what was it, Pocahontas, Arkansas. Um, you know, it was just one side of town was completely flooded. And then the other side of town, a lot of people lived there. And it was, you know, totally fine. But um, it's just so interesting how these things pan out. Now, um, I also want to let people know if you're watching this, okay, on Crazimals, on Facebook Live. If you have any questions, please let us know. Um, we'll be here for a couple more minutes uh, with Regina. She's an expert. I have been asking a lot of questions, and I don't know how many more I have, honestly. I'm trying to think. You guys got any? All right. So, um, Regina, how did you get into this, by the way? I mean, were you kind of like a dog lover growing up, and you, or were you just kind of like an animal lover in general? <laughs> Well, I, I was inspired by my dad would take me on camping trips and, nice. and around the country and fishing and getting outdoors all the time. And that definitely sparked my interest. But I really fell in love with wolves because they, I have to be honest, I love underdogs. Um, you know, whenever there's a sporting event, I always root for the guys who, who may not win. Uh, I, love, I love the underdogs because I want to see them succeed. And the wolf is the same way. There's just, like I said, there's a lot of misinformation out there about them, but yet they're just like the coolest animal ever. Their families are so much like ours. 
the mom and dad are really good leaders. They take care of the pups. Um, the, the brothers and sisters help take care of their little sisters and brothers, and it's just neat watching them. So I'm seeing all these, you know, these videos of the wolves, and I'm just thinking to myself, okay, so these wolves, they're, they're, you know, they're in captivity, much like, you know, a dog would be at somebody's house. What is the difference between that wolf and, say, my dog at home, who's a half, half husky, half German shepherd? Well, the, the difference is, is that our dogs have had 10,000 years of very specialized breeding by us humans to get them to be the domestic animal that we have today. Wolves are wild animals. Um, they are definitely very different than our dogs in that aspect. Um, and the guys at our facility, um, we are hands off with. We don't pet them, we don't talk to them, we don't habituate them, we don't hand feed them in any way. Um, so that when they do go out into the wild, they have those wild instincts. They know how to hunt, they know how to stay away from people. Um, and that's, that's a big difference between wolves and dogs. Okay, so you guys don't try to like train them or anything like that, it's pretty hands off? Yeah, with our recovery species, with the Mexican wolf and the red wolf, we actually work with and partner with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service to choose animals from our facility to release back into the wild to try and get the wild numbers up. You know, when you're talking about 130 or less animals, um, they definitely need an infusion of, of new animals out there, and we help with that. All right. Well, I really want to thank you for your time here, Regina. This has been pretty cool because I didn't know much about these guys. And, you know, every time I do one of these Facebook Lives, I learn a lot. That's why I like doing them. Uh, Eureka, Missouri. Okay, it's just outside of St. Louis. That's the Endangered Wolf Center. Uh, good stuff that's going on down there. Really good work and good luck with everything. Um, some pretty cool science that's going on there, too. And be safe in the flooding, all right? Thanks again for popping on. And thank you, everybody, um, who joined us here on Facebook Live. It was fun hanging out with you guys. We'll see you next time.